Sure. So 2024 was the year that I talked about a recession when we were back in 2022. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I think we're starting to see really a strong indication that that's where we're heading. It's interesting that you say about the deficit spending. I, I don't think Americans as a group understand the difficulty we placed ourselves in. You know, in early 2023, the Congressional Budget Office, really the last bastion of anything that's bipartisanship left in Washington, issued an alert saying that in less than 10 years, they saw the deficit, I'm sorry, the debt rising to $50 trillion. Welcome to Metals and Miners. I'm its founder and its host, Gary Bohm. 2023 was a year of confusion, where the markets and the economy did not meet the expectation of most experts. The current period we're in is not like the previous 15 years, as the government is betting on massive deficit spending to keep the economy and the markets running hot, while valuations are stretched to their extremes. Narratives of a melt-up, resurgent inflation, and even an economic crash rivaling the Great Depression are circling all around. U.S. debt has exploded as if we're in wartime, and the U.S. dollar and treasuries are under historic pressure. The consumer is struggling, with many taking on two jobs and turning to credit cards and other loans like never before to make ends meet. Meanwhile, some commodities like uranium are breaking out hard due to years of underinvestment and supply and demand dynamics. Today is the very first show for Metals and Miners, and we are so fortunate to sit down to discuss all of this and more with Peter Grandage, a four-decade Wall Street veteran, portfolio manager, chief market strategist, business, retirement, and estate planner, and all-around media savant. Peter, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, it's an honor to be uh, your first person, so that means when I'm done, it can only go up for you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, right. All right, Peter, let's begin with your 2023 macro expectations. What you got right, what happened that surprised you, and then please transition into what your macro view for the economy and markets is for 2024. Well, 2023 was the, the best of time and the worst of time for me. Uh, I had gotten in for the first time ever into uranium in 2019 and 20 in a big way in state with the producers and the companies that physically buy it. And 2023 was really when the traction uranium took hold. And as we got into year end, it, you know, people have gains of three, four, five hundred percent in some gains. On the other side, I also got very involved into the junior resource market in general, gold stocks, silver, copper, and they were crushed and I was crushed with them. And uh, probably somewhere in the middle, I was fortunate enough to move out of general equities and got out of bonds at a real, at the almost the absolute low in the yields. And that preserved a lot of money. And that's part of my transition now into 2024. I, I began the year by saying something I never said before in, in my 40, now into my 40th year, I said that we are in a perfect storm now or near perfect storm of social, political and economic upheaval that sometime within three or five years, it may be earlier, but I don't think it'll be longer than three or five years. We'll find ourselves in the middle of something that will rival or even surpass what it was like to be in the Great Depression. And that's not a... Uh, business boomer for me. I'm still, my main business still is, is a, a form of financial planning using cash flow. But I can tell you, most people don't want to hear uh, that, especially as you noted, that the market is in a melt up mind frame. And that once again, the don't worry, be happy crowd on Wall Street is basically signaling all systems are go. And I don't think anything could be further from the truth. If you invest for more than a few weeks or a few months. I think if your outlook is passed into years, I think there's all sorts of trouble coming and much of it has already begun right here, right now. It, it, it seems as if the US government is running mass deficits to inject liquidity into the economy and the markets, like a Keynesian approach 
for sure. Do you expect the markets to stay positive and the economy to avoid a recession for all or part of 2024? And what do you expect to happen with tax receipts through 2024 and 2025? Sure. So 2024 was the year that I talked about a recession when we were back in 2022. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I think we're starting to see really a strong indication that that's where we're heading. It's interesting that you say about the deficit spending. I, I don't think Americans as a group understand the difficulty we placed ourselves in. You know, in early 2023, the Congressional Budget Office, really the last bastion of anything that's bipartisanship left in Washington, issued an alert saying that in less than 10 years, they saw the deficit, I'm sorry, the debt euro dollars. And the concern at that time that they expressed was the ability to start making and paying and continuing those interest payments uh, at such a large debt. Now, they've actually shortened that horizon because the deficit spending has gone just haywire. We've uh, we spent almost $3 trillion that we don't own in 2023. Uh, and since the fiscal year started, November 1st, we've already have another $600 billion in a deficit. And they haven't really put a budget plan together in almost 20-something years. They keep using these things that kind of push it forward, get into a crisis, agree to some things, and go forward again. And I don't think Americans understand that at $50 trillion in a 5% interest rate, which is not high, is $2.5 trillion in interest expense. The government only took in last year, its best year ever, a little over $5 trillion in revenue. Now, that will rise somewhat, but it's certainly not going to rise at the rate that interest expense is going to rise. So we're now within a few years. This is within most people who are watching this, God willing, are going to be living in this time frame when it gets to that level. And they have no idea how the government can continue in the way that it's grown accustomed to. And, you know, 65% of Americans are working paycheck to paycheck. They have little or no savings. They're not going to reach the retirement level that those nice commercials uh, describe at a time when uh, political paralysis is widespread. Not only can the not two parties go in a room now and do real lawmaking, but they got groups within their own parties that can't stand other members in the own party. So, and we can go on. There's two other things I think that are critical real quick if you want, if you want to talk about it. But let me yeah, note them. Yeah. The immigration invasion is moving up to fastly becoming the number one problem in the U.S. because now it's finally impacting everyday Americans in their life. And the BRICS. People in Wall Street have just paid little or no regard to what is happening worldwide with the formation of the BRICS and countries that are coming together to eliminate being involved with the U.S., not lessen it or expand their roles separate from the U.S., have nothing to do with the United States. And so, like I said, all these things and so many other reasons have led me to suggest that if your planning is out past the next few months or a year or so, I really think you have to start planning some, some really, really tough times. We're on a similar wavelength. I'm going to be touching on the $50 trillion, uh, in debt from the CBO. I'm going to be touching um, on a few of the other points you've made. I do want to point out, and you may have seen this, just today the Supreme Court voted in favor of pulling down uh, some of the razor wire that Texas has put up on the southern border. And there were um, different types of trucks and activity going on there today, removing it as folks were standing by looking to come on in over the border. So your point is so valid. So let, let me just touch on something that's really important on that immigration thing. It, it's a bit of a situation for me because the secular person in me has one opinion and the spiritual person has a slightly different opinion of it. So there's no question there's some very bad people coming across the border. You can't have 10 million, 15 million people coming and not expect that some of them are going to be trouble. But still, a lion's share of these people are people leaving very poor conditions from countries that are glad that they're gone. I mean, they actually probably walked them to the border and said, go ahead. And they're coming because what they end up with here, even though we may not think it's worthy enough, we certainly wouldn't want to live that way, to them is something that it has been unimaginable. 
So not only do they come and, and, and stay, but then they reach out to all their friends and relatives back wherever they were and say, you got to get here too. And that's what we're seeing now. That's why the, the sizes of, of people come in more and so forth and so on. But they're coming only with the shirts on their backs. And so as good as tension they may be, and it may be many of them may be hardworking and all, they're going to start at the lower r- r- rungs and they're going to depend on government support for a whole lot of things. In addition to all the others that are here already in different walks of life that are at a time when you and I just talked about how bad the government's really in in the fiscal position it's in. So it's a it's a it's a huge, huge problem that now only because, you know, a couple of years ago, oh, we turned on the TV, we saw this border crisis in Arizona and Texas. That's not our problem. Then a year ago, they started sending them up to cities, which was a good move because that's what made it a national issue. But still, to a lot of people, it wasn't. But now people are seeing that uh, people being kicked out of a school so they can house it. People were uh, had housing that was supposed to be built for them, and now it's being taken over f- by immigrants who are going to live for rent free for two years. And it, 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 it it's becoming even in this, as you and I speak, as they're about to have the New Hampshire uh, primaries, people suddenly in all the media, even the left wing media, when they went in and asked people, what's the number one problem? Immigration. And so it it, it and a lot of other things uh, really have me in a very bearish frame of mind. It, it really feels like there's a lot of plates that are spinning on top of a pencil here that if a small breeze comes by, they're going to come crashing down. Um, a lot of challenges that we're facing. Uh, so you've been around economics and investing for quite a while, and you're an astute researcher and analyst of the times. Is there a prior period that the current period most looks like to you, and for what reasons? No, I, I think this is unique. Uh, you know, when I said to people in my podcast beginning of the year that this what I see coming uh, is going to make the Great Depression look like a walk in a park. And people went, whoa, why is that? Well, at least in the Great Depression, a couple things. One, we were much more morally based. We were willing to be much more helpful with one another. And a lot of people at that time were still living off of farms. And, you know, we were not yet a true industrial nation. Now, there are so many people dependent on government in one way or another. We have an aging society too. Remember now, the biggest polls among people 65 and over, I live in a 55 and over community, is not dying. The number one concern people have is running out of money before they die. And so th- there's a whole bastion of things here that are so much different than any other time. I can't recognize this as anything other. And, and and let me make one other point because people say, well, how does that impact the stock market? The stock market that I knew when I started and what exists now is totally different. You, know, you watch a financial network and they show you sitting down at the New York Stock Exchange, that might as well be a museum. First of all, most of the trading doesn't take place there. But when I started in 1984, 90% of the trading was individuals and they were buying stocks for what the stock market was created for a place where you can buy and sell part ownerships of businesses. Very few people use the stock market for that reason anymore. First of all, half the money that's currently in the market is in passive investments. It's not being actively managed. It's tracing indexes or groups. The manager is not responsible to buy and sell each day and all. The remaining half, 75%, if not more of that, is in some computer-driven algorithm program that's trading either based on news stories that have words or very complicated programs at all. Very few people have all that, all that money is there is buying stocks because, hey, I think they're going to make more widgets to do a better service. It'll go up in value and I'll be able to sell it for more than I'm paying for it. And much of the older people that still are in the markets are thinking 30 or 40 years ago and not understanding that this has become very a high tech casino. It's a it, and, and and the people who say to me, and the worst thing I, like, I hate to hear when I, people say, well, I'm trading the market. And I go, well, you got a pea shooter and they got nuclear weapons. Good luck. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I think that's a thing that's not discussed often, but really should be if you're going to be looking at the market. It's not the stock market that we grew up with. Are you of the opinion that the same algorithms that are 
uh, propelling the market higher with the words and whatnot, as you say, will also in reverse propel it lower when the time comes through the same types of you know negative. Absolutely, you, you hit it up. And one thing I can tell you after forty years, markets go down a whole lot faster than they went up, and no matter what market it is. Mm -hmm. And 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 that's that's the trouble we run with. We didn't get in twenty twenty two, even though it was a pretty rough year for a lot of people. We didn't get any real net liquidation of the passive funds. Mm -hmm. That was the key for the market not to. However, this is a financial industry with no disrespect to young people because I was once a young guy when I started 40 years ago. But the vast majority of financial advisors today, in fact, almost half now, have only been practicing since the last mini financial crisis in 2008. And well over 75% have only been in since the new millennium started. And basically, they have learned to drive on a one-way street. Yeah, there's been a couple of interruptions. And 2022, suddenly, for the first time, they saw the traffic circle. And, like, oh, my God, what do we do here? But they haven't had to sustain a period of little or no gains or, or worse, going down. Give me a couple of years of that, and I think this financial advisory group out there will be like deer in headlights. And yeah. I can just see it when I hear them talk and they don't have enough substance. You know, a lot of financial advisors can't even read a balance sheet. They certainly don't understand what is happening with BRICS and how the world impacting uh, that to me is going to be as big as the industrial revolution was. Uh, so I, I just, again, think that there won't be the political will or ability to to help. And I don't think the financial service industry is going to be a place where the average person can, can turn to and that be prepared for what I think is about to, you know, to unfold. Experience really matters is what I hear you saying. Yeah. You know, well, listen, I, I still found myself on the worst side of a bear market in my entire 40 year career for the last 12 or 18 months. So experience doesn't necessarily give you the rights but it does give you a leg up and, you know, you don't get a discount when you use less experience. You know, it's one thing. So I says, Hey, I'm only going with this guy, Fred down here. He's I'm no knocking anybody. that's Fred watching this. I just picked that name, but he's only been doing it three years and all, but I only pay one tenth what I'd pay with a guy like Grandage. That would be okay, but that's not the case. We all basically start at the same spot. And here I do think experience is going to be something that's going to be quite useful in the months and years ahead. Yeah, I appreciate that. So, Peter, in, in uh, 2023, the U.S. deficit ran at about a $4 trillion deficit run rate. It was about 7 to 9% GDP. Uh, plus, they funded multiple wars in, in an economy that was running full employment. That's never happened before. And recently, in the 2000 and 2008 downturns, the markets lost more than 50% of their value and deficits blew out to 6 to 12% during that time. If that were to happen again and we would have a deficit of what, 6, 10, 15 trillion, which then would put our deficit at what, 25 to 50% of GDP? This has never happened before. And yet the probability of this scenario unfolding is literally increasing daily. How do the countries of the world view our currency and our treasuries if and when the economy or the stock markets roll over like this as we're nearing the end of this business cycle? And at that point, what happens to sound money, gold, silver, et cetera, and what happens to the U.S. dollar? So the pandemic, we learned a lot of lessons. The biggest is that it was not what they said it was, was from the beginning. But one of the things we learned also is how critical people are living day to day. I told you before, 65%, the number is, it hovers between that and 70%, a working paycheck to paycheck. But many Americans don't even have $1,000 saved for emergencies. So it kind of showed you it was the worst case scenario because basically everything shut down, but it showed you how thin we were or how less supportive people could be if there really is a dramatic downturn for whatever reason or reasons that caused that. I think what, again, going back to the BRICS situation, people do not understand that America is just not 
And it's harder for people in my, my age, you know, 65, 75, that grew up in a much more patriotic, seemingly more morally based and religious based uh, society to think that people today don't have those carings. They don't have the faith. And quite frankly, America isn't the power that it once was both economically and militarily. And it is always a turn on a world reserve currency when the military and the economic power base turns down. That's what, you know, Great Britain was the last one before us. And so uh, I see the United States slipping and continuing. I don't think there's a replacement tomorrow for the world reserve currency of the dollar, but it's clearly been less and less usage as each year goes by. And I think one day we'll wake up, probably it'll be a few more years for the BRICS to get so large that we'll wake up to at least some sort of currency or system that they're using to at least trade among themselves or possibly with the entire world. And that will have some sort of backing, most likely will be gold. And it's one of the reasons why two of the biggest players, actually three of the biggest players, have been accumulating large sums of gold because they realize that you won't be able to replace a useless paperless, you know, paper, just paper currency with another one. People are going to demand something that's more safe and secure. And that's one of the reasons why gold has done so well. And here's here's a big statistic that shocks people. I say to all these young finance, I was just the other day with, a, with six or seven, couldn't have been 30 years old, you know, somewhere between 25 and 30, a few years working in the financial service business, hot to try to have all the latest stuff. And I said to them, I said, well, let me ask you something. What has performed better since the new millennium started? Stock market or gold? No question, stock markets kill gold. And then I showed them the actual facts that even compounding and reinvesting the dividends from the S&P 500, gold is still outperformed. It is the most disrespected, worse than Rodney Dangerfield, no respect, relic that the financial service industry treats like kryptonite. And yet, not only for that period, but for a couple thousand years, It's performed rather well. And now people want to tell me that something that's stored in some digit in some cyberspace out there is better for me than something that's worked for 2000 years. And I can actually hold it and possess it. Sorry, call me old fashioned. I get all the the Bitcoin nuts and that's what they are. They're crypto nuts uh, telling me how crazy I am. But I'll stick with that for whatever time left I have. So gold is disrespected. It has performed to the level that you're talking about, has outperformed the market. What happens when people realize I need gold? The last few times that folks ran to gold in mass, I mean, it it moved like no other bull market. I can tell you it's been under heavy accumulation by people of wealth. There's no way. And of course, the central banks are the leaders in that. There's no way that this amount of physical gold that keeps being clearly taken off the market. Very important to understand that we've seen a major shift on where gold trades, and that's going to play a big role on how it trades. For many years, London and the COMEX uh, Mm -hmm. is where it traded, and it was always infiltrated by people who like to play the downside, not the upside. But ever since China and other areas in Asia opened up, Uh, futures trading and physical trading, uh, that ability to do that to the paper market lessens more and more. In fact, 10 or 20 years ago, when there was a 50 or $100 raid, it stayed down for weeks or months. Now, at best, it stays down for a few days. And uh, so as tough as it is sometimes for people that watch gold, because many of them also have mining shares and we just went through the worst year possible, The the point of the matter is gold has traded extremely well, has earned its keep. And I think in the period of what we're seeing going forward, it's going to earn its keep even more. And please, I don't have any relationship with any bullion dealer. I don't get anything from this and all. But it is my observation and my personal belief that I would sooner own gold right now than even general equities. And I'm not telling everybody to sell equities and buy gold, but for me and for what my needs are, that's where I choose to be. Let's shift over to demographics. 
the labor force back during Volcker's time, during the late 70s, early 80s, was very different than today. There was more people working because the boomer generation was in their prime. The female labor force was rising. So combined, there was a lot of labor that was coming in. Also, the politics was changing. In 1981, uh, President Reagan famously fired the air traffic controllers because they dared to go on strike. So retrospectively speaking, it seemed easier to get inflation down due to the expanding labor force and a more competitive environment. There was simply more labor supply and the politics seemed to be very supportive. Today, we have a shrinking labor supply pool. Women are fully in the workforce. And on the whole, the labor force is skilled much differently than back then. Also, the boomers' parents weren't well off back then, so the boomers had to hustle. They took on odd jobs to put themselves through school. Today's generations have it completely different. It's much easier. Their parents have access, they have access to just easy school loans. So they don't work as hard. They don't hustle the same. The labor market is completely different. And now geopolitics is getting worse. And deglobalization, like you had mentioned, those forces are rising up. How do you see today's different demographic situation playing out with regards to inflation, growth, unemployment, the economy, et cetera? Well, the biggest problem we start with is we have a government agency Bureau of Labor Statistics, initials of BLS, they really should drop the L because you can't trust anybody that 11 out of 12 months greatly overestimates the employment number yeah. only to then the next month. Yeah, last month was actually not as good, but this month is great. And yeah. then that happens next month and next month and next month. And we found out that over 450,000 jobs uh really weren't created. And then their birth death model is just a, an, just a betrayal of honesty. And they create, you know, a, a much better picture than that really exists. And then lastly, the way they do that count, and most people don't know it. Let's say I had a great job and, and suddenly I lose it and I got to go out and get two or three part-time jobs to make what I used to make at my one full-time job. Well, when they go out and count, they count me as three people working, even though it's one person doing three jobs just to make up for the one before. So the labor statistics uh, are not trusty, trusty to the level that Wall Street, you know, every month reacts and get experts on saying, well, because of that, this, that and the other thing. The Democrats are I'm sorry, the demographics of what you mentioned is interesting. Yeah. Uh, for the first time, probably this next generation is going to work harder and make less than the previous generation. Something that went against whatever the American dream was. And that's going to have ramifications on the economy, inflation, and all those other things and all. And then also, what do we do with 10 to 20 million extra people, supposedly, hopefully, looking for work and so forth, all at the levels where really yeah. employment has switched to? Service industry. We're not a manufacturing uh, we're certainly not a farming anymore. We're certainly not a manufacturing economy anymore. And these people coming into the service industry at a time when, you know, how many how many additional hospitality and bartenders and things nature uh, do we need, especially when restaurants are struggling to stay open? Uh, so this whole you kind of used before earlier pencil and, 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 and a dish spinning. It is something like that. And uh, it, like I said, it's one of many, many reasons why I just don't have a very bullish outlook. Uh, and at the beginning of the inflation spike after the pandemic stimulus printing, the Fed repeatedly stated that inflation was transitory. And they did nothing about it for quite some time before they finally relented. They were late to raising interest rates. Once they did raise the rates, they had to embark on the fastest and the strongest rate raising campaign that we've seen in recent history. Now they're nearing the end of the policy hiking cycle. And in fact, they haven't raised rates in several quarters. And like always in a rate hiking cycle, there will come a time where the Fed will need to actually lower 
rates. Do you see the Fed being on time with their rate reductions? Or do you think they'll be late to the game the way they were with the rate raises? And if they're late, what are the implications and the consequences of that? Well, I believe there's a sign in the Federal Reserve that says anyone that says the word transitory would be shot immediately <laughs> because it was one of the biggest goofs, misjudgments, whatever you want to call it, in the history of the Federal Reserve. At the end of the day, if we're correct and we're going, no politician can sustain hard deflation. It, it, it's too hard on more people in the general public who they have to answer to. Same thing as you and I talk, China is going to have to embark on a massive easing policy in order to correct some of the worsening conditions that they see there. So, yes, uh, lowering rates or ramping up money supply is a more likely scenario than a much higher interest rate uh, or a Volcker thing that people were fearful was going to happen and all. But what I think the mistake would be is we have a financial community that thinks once the Fed eases, they create what's called a put and that it can't miss right. because if the stock market comes off, they'll just come in and, and bail us out. And, and that attitude is, again, prevalent. It may not be spoken every day as it used to be, but it's prevalent if you talk to people and read between the lines. That is a mistake because they don't understand that things can become so terrible that even the Federal Reserve can't save the day. And that's where I think we're heading. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate that. Um, let's talk about the dollar, Dixie. In 2023, famed investor Stanley Druckenmiller told us that his only high conviction trade is to short the U.S. dollar. It took almost about three months for the U.S. debt to go from 33 to 34 trillion. So we're currently on this 4 trillion annual deficit run rate. And that means in four short years, or around 2028, the U.S. debt will hit the same 50 trillion that you mentioned earlier. So we're a little ahead of the CBO pace. And that's without any economic slowdown or recession. What's the bull and the bear case for the U.S. dollar? And on which side of the coin do you fall? Well, you're going to have to find somebody else to give you the bull case. Uh, I, I, I can't come up with one. I, you know, one of the things that kept the dollar alive these last few years, honestly, is just the fact that it was seemed to be the lesser of two evils. You know, where else were you going to go? But like I told you, central banks and sophisticated people have put money into gold because they realize that there is no one currency uh, that really you can count on. So I, I can't make a bullish case for it. Uh, I, I will just say that right now, People got too excited about these massive cuts that they were expecting the Fed to do. Uh, I don't think they are going to do it anytime soon. And that has given some strength to the dollar, especially when you look at what's happening. Uh, there's no reason to think the euro suddenly is going to take off. China's having issues and all. But I, at the same time, don't think there's any room for them to raise rates dramatically because We've already seen in the short period of time that they did it, how impactful it was negatively in the real estate market, in the car market. And now we're watching, you know, I was telling somebody before you and I spoke, we used to call people that charge 20 percent interest rates loan shocks. Well, now credit cards are between 20 and 30 percent. And how they get you, it's worse than heroin because mm -hmm. the person borrows too much. They can only make the minimum payment and then they just keep adding it on. And it's like that loan shot guy showing up every week for his big. And that's all you can do is pay the minimum. And they really hooked. And the president that this president set by bailing out these student loans, even though it was supposed to be only a few billion yeah. dollars, is what about me? Somebody that worked hard, paid for my college kids and others that took out loans and paid it. Now you're letting the same type of person listen. They didn't get anything dishonest. They didn't get anything less than the people that paid it off. They just can't now pay or they claim they can't pay. Okay, so now when you don't let them, that's a U.S. asset. It's the biggest single U.S. asset on our books is student loans. 
Nope. They have to raise the tax money from somewhere. So I'm going to pay twice for doing the right thing. I'm going to pay when they didn't. And then I'm going to pay higher taxes because they can't pay. And let me ask you this. What's to stop them from saying the next thing? Well, you know, we really got to help the people with housing. Exactly. Uh, we're going to have to pay off some people's mortgages or mm -hmm. credit cards. And all. We, we've opened the Pandora's box at the worst possible time. So, so what I'm hearing, though, is that you're bearish on the dollar. Did you get that out of all of that? <laughs> okay. Well, I'm glad that you brought up the credit cards because actually that's going to be part of my next question. I want to talk about the, cons the U.S. consumer. Um, and there's a lot of credit card information in here that I'm going to spit out. Consumer debt is over a trillion dollars in aggregate. Average rates are well over the 20%, like you mentioned. The average American is putting 48% of their purchases on their credit card. 46% of Americans don't pay their credit card balance in full each month. 30% say it's been two years or longer since they had a zero balance. 22% hit their credit card limit at least once every single year. 42% have requested an increase in their limit. And 33% pay at least $100 or more a month in interest on the credit card alone. There's even more statistics for the U.S. consumer that are concerning. 17.5% of buyers purchasing a new car in the third quarter of 2023 are paying more than $1,000 per month for their vehicle. Monthly mortgage payments have never been higher, and property taxes are re-rating at 20, 30, 40% higher because values have jumped. The same for homeowners insurance. Even Google searches for give back the car are at all time highs. There's so many other metrics uh, that are showing how tough it is for the consumer today. The consumer makes up 70% roughly of the economy. If the current trend continues for the consumer, do you see a moment of reckoning coming for the consumer? Excuse me. And is there a time frame that you're thinking uh, that this reckoning can take place. Again, this fits all into part of, like I said, the three to five years. I don't think we can get past three to five years without having this crisis of all crisis to ever hit America. You know, it's interesting that you bring up the consumer and everybody talks, well, how does the stock market? I keep hearing from people like, uh, I'm struggling to stay alive. And why, why are people buying stocks now? Well, there's about 13% of the of the is of the stock market that benefits is to the elite people of very high wealth who actually have made a lot more money since the pandemic uh first hit the shores where 70 80 percent of the people are not seeing the benefit of the stock market uh and related things to that that can only go on so long more and more people are falling through the cracks not getting out of the cracks and climbing to the top of the penthouse and it's, it's, it's just a question of when, not if. And when you throw what you just brought out, which are great statistics, you know, you talk about cars. I have a, a client that has several auto dealerships and he was telling me just the other day, Pete, I don't know what we're going to do for business. Why do you say that? He says, so many of the people are upside down. And I said, what do you mean upside down? He says, well, they own more than the cars are worth. That plays into what you said, people searching what happens if I turn the car back. Now, when the housing issue helped, happen. People aren't about to do that, but people are easily going to go with a car and go, here, take it. All right. So you give me bad credit. I can't get a car, right? But I can't make these thousand dollar payments. I said, and he told me how, you know, unconceivable how many car loans are five, six or seven years durations now. That's the only way people were getting in cars because of the prices that went up and all. So I guess the, the big, big picture to answer you here is that it's not well for most people and it's getting worse. And that's why I said is they can only keep the scheme and, 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 and all the stuff that's been going on for so long. And then the reality or, or gravity will take hold and will pull it down. All right, let's shift over to the BRICS plus like you were talking about earlier. It is a very important issue that's uh, underappreciated. Like you said, uh, the BRICS plus currently represents as they currently are situated. 42% of the global population, 27% of the world's land mass, 18% of global trade, 31.5% of global GDP, which by the way, 
is more than the G7 nations, which total 30.7. They possess approximately 45% of the global oil reserves and over 60% of the natural gas reserves. Now they've added Saudi Arabia, Iran, and other members to the consortium. The BRICS, like you said, seem to overtly be moving away from the dollar in order to create a multipolar currency world where the U.S. dollar no longer singularly dominates. And by the way, none of this is lost on Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell, who in March of 2022 was answering a question at a press conference, and he stated there is room for another reserve currency. So this acknowledgement that the U.S. dollar may experience a leveling of its dominant position and move towards a more equitable playing field in the coming years, to me, is quite astounding. The threat is real to the dollar, but it's not guaranteed. And just like you said, the dollar is not going away tomorrow. Nobody's claiming that. But little by little, inch by inch, the BRICS are making changes to their transactional spend. And little by little, they're using alternative methods to settle that. So what, in your opinion, is the implications of all of this, et cetera? Well, you pretty much said it all there. Uh, I think what people have to recognize is that, remember, as they grow and trade among themselves, uh, leaving out the United States where they might have included them before, that's a negative for us. We're certainly not going to benefit from this. How does the United States suddenly see people who might have purchased our widgets or whatever it may be now are using? But one of the benefits of being the world reserve currency is you can run bigger deficits and print more money because of that. And what no one talks about, even when you ask them for the worst case scenario is what happens if there is an alternative, as the Fed said? even not a replacement, just something else. Where do those dollars go that they were using? They just don't go poof. They got to go somewhere. They come back into economy where more dollars would be chasing fewer goods, which is only inflationary. That's why inflation is the, the end result of all this. It's not a massive deflationary spiral that the depression was. It's an inflationary uh, outlook that you can only have going forward. So let's shift over to gold. Since 2020, gold's been in a roughly $400 trading range from $1,650 on the low end to $2,050 on the high end. I know it went up a little higher than that, but that's been basically the range. Um, it's been four years that it's fluctuated in that range, almost as, as if it's awaiting new marching orders. It's like it's saying, do I move up from here? Do I move down from here? Tell me where to go. So what is this range bound tell you and what do you see as the next marching orders for gold well gold and silver but gold more has been in a technical pattern called a cup and handle all, for over a decade and while the highs have remained the same the lows each time are higher lows we can go back and see that just 18 months ago whatever we were in the 1600s and uh, here we are now, I don't know how many days in a row now, 30, 40 or something where we've been above 2,000 in a price, a number that people didn't think we would get to. The bear certainly didn't. So I, I view it as a very, very bullish pattern. It is uh, built a very long base. It is moving up in segments versus spiking and then crashing and throwing everybody off. And so I, I view it as extremely, extremely bullish. If not for an old saying that us so-called experts used to say at the gold shows around the world that I used to speak at, owning mining shares is like owning gold. Last year proved that wrong. <laughs> and uh, while gold went up, mining shares went down. And uh, I, I, like I said, I, I've, I've in a sense bet my own ranch on, on gold continuing to go higher and chose it for the last two years over general equities. And it's not something I'm advising anyone else to do. It just worked out for me and the risk tolerance that I was willing to take. So uh, I think it's trading extremely well. Like we pointed out before, it's outperformed stocks uh, for quite some time, even though most people don't acknowledge that. And I think that's going to continue.
So you mentioned earlier in our conversation that gold has been treated like a pet rock. It's an old relic. It's just discarded and underappreciated. And it, it has frustrated investors being, you know, so range bound and their recent bias on the metals pretty bad as it's moved up and down in this $400 or so channel. A lot of the, a lot of them are looking at the mag seven, you know, and it's up to historic levels. Have gold investors become disoriented to what's happening with gold and why gold will move once again? And what's your message to those who either own gold and are frustrated, have owned gold and have given up or are looking at gold as an investment and have seen the sideways chop and say, oh, this is not for me? Well, again, someone and some group and we know who they are to some extent, central banks are key ones have been major buyers and, and are quite pleased with the price action that they've had and certainly don't want it to run away because it's obvious they want to continue to buy, to buy more. I think if you take out any ownership of shares, mining shares, junior resource stocks, and just look at the physical performance of it, you have to be pleased. The negativity comes or the disappointment it hasn't done better is because we own shares that didn't respond in the manner that we thought that they would. Mm -hmm. uh, and that has created an illusion that somehow gold is not doing as well. Then you have this complete new kid on the block, cryptocurrencies. And it has taken out some money that otherwise would have gone into gold. You can't fight that fact. But the, the fact remains is despite all that, Gold continues to do what it should do. What it could buy 10 years ago, it buys now. What it could buy 100 years ago, it can buy now. And I think it'll do the same 10 or 20 years from now. So what I hear you saying that as the debt increases, as inflation increases, as the BRICS send dollars back here, et cetera, et cetera, and purchasing power in the fiat currency degrades and we could buy less with it and it's, everything's more expensive, the actual physical gold will still remain on par, be able to buy the same levels that, that it, it bought before. Absolutely. And think about this. Those who have it in other currencies, people outside the United States have bought have actually done even better. Yeah. Because of what's happened with the currency. So no, uh, gold is my favorite uh, place to be. It's uh, I, I'm not a gold bug. I've, I've been out of it. I was out of it for almost four years. But I think going forward with all the things you and I discussed today, uh, I think it has a much better safety of principle and opportunity to steal off of capital gains. And capital preservation versus capital appreciation is the way people should approach markets now. It's not how much you're going to make that's going to separate you from the winners and losers. It's how much you don't lose. That's an important point. Um, there's not many commodities that are currently priced at about half of their all-time nominal high. But silver is actually one of them, and it's under 50% of its all-time high. And, you know, the gold-silver ratio, the mean is about 50, and it's currently sitting in the high 80s to around 90. Uh, silver's reported to have a supply deficit. Its applications are increasing, military weapons, solar panels, electronics, etc. Plus its historic use as a monetary metal. What do you see for silver moving forward? What's your silver thesis? Silver has always been in my book, until most recently, a second class citizen. And boy, I used to get beaten up by the silver bulls when I would say that at a show and all. But it didn't have the same characteristics that gold had. It has improved in that area because its industrial usage has improved. But it still needs gold to lead and to break out and to bring momentum and interest back into the metals. And then it has an opportunity to take some time where it could actually be doing better than gold during periods of time. But it's just not going to be the first of the two choices among very serious minded money people. Gold still is chosen over silver. Not that they don't buy silver, but they buy gold first and they might outweigh themselves. I personally think given how the spread has come between it now, that having an equal amount for someone that's first coming in the market now can be advantageous to them 
because silver is actually cheap relative to gold. And we still believe that gold itself is going to go higher. So I, I'm not against owning silver or even having equal amounts, but I'm not one of those people that think you have to have so much silver and so little gold. I'm still a believer that gold should lead silver. Peter, thank you for being so generous with your time, your analysis, your ideas, and for coming on to Metals and Miners. It's been so good to spend the time with you. Please tell the viewers where they can learn more about your work, how they can connect with you, and where you can be found on social media. Well, I'm, I'm glad I was your first one. It was most interesting. You sound like me. I really feel that you could sit in for me now. If I get ill, you can come sit in my chair because you and I think an awful lot and you have done a lot of hard work there, good work. And I really want to wish, and I'm honored, I, I say that sincerely on the life of my child, that I am your first first guest. But I have petergranich.com as a website. There's a blog there. It's free. I spent a lot of time on Twitter. I can't call it X. I still kind of call it Twitter. Uh, and I have a YouTube channel where I post interviews like yours. And occasionally I interview other people myself. Fantastic. I want to remind everyone, if you're a premium subscriber to the Substack, metalsandminers.substack.com, not only do you get a bunch of free content throughout the week, but you also get the nugget notes from each interview, which is our downloadable recap summary of the discussion, some premium interview content with our guest that is not on this video, and access to the Metals and Miners Report Library, among other benefits. Peter, thank you so much for the time that you spent. Thank you, Gary, and God bless him. May you have a most successful uh, career in what you're doing now. Thank you.